The long-awaited 2022 MacBook Air redesign is finally here, and I gotta say, our concept was spot on in terms of the shape, uh, sadly not in terms of the colors, so we don't have those rainbow colors, but we do have a new Midnight, which looks awesome. But you know about all of these changes, so here are 17 more that you probably didn't know about. This video is sponsored by Vivid, the mind-blowing application that enables some insane brightness levels on your MacBook, so everything you do can be clearer and crisper. Use your MacBook outdoors without glare being an issue, even watch Zone of Tech videos like you've never seen them before. Stick around to hear about their amazing upcoming promotion. And now, back to the video. With well, the first one being external display support. Yes, it's um, still limited to one, and I don't know, I, I'm very, very disappointed. Th this was the main downside of the M1 models, the fact that you could not connect more than one monitor. And the thing is, I used two displays at work, and even if I wanted to get the MacBook Air, I wouldn't be able to do that. Like, we all thought that this was a limitation of the M1 chip design, but apparently it's just the core count that is not enough. Now, there are some workarounds uh, for this. You can buy uh, these display link adapters or this brand new anchor dock, which is very expensive. And the thing is, uh, that dock doesn't do 4K 60. You have a 30 hertz limitation for 4K. Uh, and then uh, you have some other resolution limitations and the overall image quality with display link is not that great. Uh, so yeah, compared to natively running two monitors, these options are significantly inferior. You don't have this limitation with Windows laptops, so for this price point, I think this is honestly really, really bad. Then we have the screen bezels, which are thinner than on the old Air, but they're actually thicker than on the new MacBook Pros, which is really strange because like we have the notch, uh, and obviously the notch was put there in order for Apple to make the bezels as thin as possible on the Pros. So with these thicker bezels, technically we wouldn't need a notch, but it is very likely for Apple to keep the design consistent with the Pro models. And same as last year, we do have a binned model of the new MacBook Air. So the previous one had two versions, a 7-core GPU and an 8-core GPU. Uh, the previous Air is still present, by the way, but you can only get it with the 7-core GPU option. The new Air comes with the 8-core GPU option, which is the binned one, and then the 10-core, uh, which is $100 extra. I do think that most people should stick with the 8-core, but more about that in just a bit. Okay, now something weird is that we actually get not one, not two, but three different charging options. So by default, you get a standard charger, which is a 30-watt charger, so pretty much same as before. But then if you pay $20 extra, you can pick between two models of a more powerful Pro charger. So there's a 35-watt charger, which comes with two USB-C ports, and then a 67-watt charger, which comes with one USB-C port. The 35 5-watt also has collapsible pins, so that is much smaller and way more portable, but the 67-watt supports fast charging, 50% in up to 30 minutes, so just like the MacBook Pros. Now, if you buy the $1499 configuration, so the 512GB 10-core GPU, that comes by default with these Pro chargers, so you can pick whichever you want. Now, I'm pretty sure that when most of you had a look at this new MacBook Air, you thought that it looked thicker than the previous model, and that is true <laughs> to some extent. So the old Air had that wet shaped design uh, with a thickness variable between 0.41 centimeters to 161. The new Air has a constant thickness of 1.13. Uh, the 14 inch Pro, for example, is 1.55. So that is actually noticeably thicker uh, than this new Air. I gotta say, I do miss the wet shape because it also had that bulge underneath it, that belly. Uh, and it looked extremely thin because of that, so it gave you the illusion that it was this razor-thin device. But overall, it is actually more portable than the previous model, so it is lighter, 1.24 kilograms compared to 1.29. The 14-inch Pro is 1.6, so that is significantly heavier. In fact, this new MacBook Air is the lightest MacBook that Apple ever made, aside from the 12-inch MacBook, which is, you know, discontinued. And interesting enough, the width is exactly the same as on the previous model, and that is because uh, the display width doesn't, didn't change, it's just the height of it which got increased because of that notch. Oh, and guess what? The MagSafe charger now matches the color of the MacBook Air, so we have four colors and therefore four different MagSafe chargers, including Space Gray, which is <laughs> really strange because the Space Gray MacBook Pro did not come with a Space Gray MagSafe cable, it came with a silver one. Luckily, you can buy these MagSafe cables separately now for $49, but Apple should honestly offer MacBook Pro Space Gray uh, owners the option to trade in their silver cable for this new one, because it should have come with one in the box anyways. Uh, the good news with MagSafe is that now you technically have one extra port, so you can use that for charging, and then you have the two USB-C ports that you can use, one for connecting to a monitor, one for an external drive. But sadly, both USB-C ports are on the left, which is 
bit of a bummer. There's also a new RAM configuration, so 24 gigabytes on top of the existing 16 gigabytes option that we had before. 16 costs $200 extra, 24 is $400 extra. And the thing is, if you buy the higher end configuration of the Air, uh, so the 512 gigabyte, and then you add 24 gigabytes of RAM onto that, the total price will be 1900, which is really close to the 2000 that the 14 inch MacBook Pro starts from. So long story short, just don't buy 24 gigabytes, it's just not worth it on the air. Oh, and the RAM is also faster, 100 gigabyte per second bandwidth compared to 68.25. And this is also LPDDR5 memory compared to LPDDR4X. But what does this all mean? Well, it means more responsive applications, especially the ones that need some fast video memory. Because as you probably know, more RAM with Apple Silicon also means more video memory because this memory is shared. So if you do need more video memory, then do pick an option, uh, well, a 16 gigs option because the 24 is something that I just wouldn't recommend. Now, in terms of the actual display upgrades, aside from the size, which is up from 13.3 to 13.6, but keep in mind that the width is the same, it's just slightly taller because of the notch. Uh, the brightness is also higher. So it's 500 nits compared to 400, which is great. This matches the pros on all of Apple's uh, MacBooks and Macs. Um, the thing is, the MacBook Pros can display up to 1600 nits of brightness, but only in HDR. In everyday use, it's exactly the same as on the Pros. And we also have 10-bit support now, which means that uh, the Air can display up to 1 billion colors compared to 16.7 million. So this is a massive difference. So the colors that you see should be more vibrant. So just quickly, let me show you something really cool. I found a way to boost my MacBook maximum brightness from this to this. The Vivid app is available to download for the latest 14-inch or 16-inch models, and you can use it to bump the brightness way more than what you normally can. So if you're using it outdoors, it'll go as bright as your iPhone, and even brighter. You can watch non-HDR content at a crazy brightness to give you an incredibly clean and crisp image, which is a huge difference from the irregular brightness it allows you to use. And don't worry, as this won't cause any damage to your screen. Vivid is using Apple's own APIs to trick the system into thinking that it's displaying an HDR image for those insanely high HDR brightness levels. Vivid also offers a demo, so you can see the difference it would make yourself. And with 30% off between June the 6th and June the 12th, there's never been a better time to upgrade your MacBook. Check it out by using the link below. And now, back to the video. I was looking into the scaled resolutions, and um, this is a bit of a bummer. <laughs> The thing is, uh, first of all, the PPI is lower on the Air than on the Pro. So we have 254 on the MacBook Pros and 224 on the Air. The old Air actually had 227, so this is even lower than the old Air. It's still Retina quality, but uh, the downside is that if you use the perfect Retina scaling, so the 2x scaling, uh, the sharpest resolution would be 1280 by 832, which is significantly smaller than 1512 by 982, which is what we have on the Pros. So what I'm saying is if you want the sharpest image, uh, you will be able to see less on the screen of the air compared to a MacBook Pro, even though the display size is only marginally bigger on the Pro. There's also an updated headphone jack with support for high impedance headphones. So if you have any more powerful headphones, then this headphone jack will be able to drive those. The speaker system is updated, but it is a bit weird. So it has four speakers instead of two, which might seem like an upgrade, but the speaker system is now in between the keyboard and the display. So you don't actually see it. Uh, it should be better than the previous Air, but according to Apple's spec list at least, it is worse than the M2 13-inch MacBook Pro. Camera got some upgrades too, so it is 1080p compared to 720p, but what I really want to mention here is that the processing on the MacBook Pros wasn't great. Like, 1080p footage had this very soft but then overly sharpened look to it, I honestly wasn't a fan and this new Air should be identical to the MacBook Pros. But hey, the good news is that if you want to use your iPhone as a webcam for your Mac, you can just buy one of these silly attachments and do that. So what about the actual performance improvements? Well, we all know that the M2 is Apple's newest chip, but this chip is actually inferior to the M1 Pro and the M1 Mac, so it's only superior to the M1. Now, the M2 is based on A15 cores, uh, the M1 was based on A14 cores, so these core designs are indeed newer, um, but the manufacturing process is still 5 nanometers instead of 3. We do have a larger L1 cache for the high performance cores, 16 megabytes compared to 12 on the M1, and the high efficiency cores have also been improved according to Apple. But okay, what actual performance numbers should we expect to see here? Well, they're actually quite small. So on the CPU side, we have the same 8 core design, uh, and the overall performance is 80% higher than the M1. Now, on the GPU side, we have those two extra cores, and we have 25% faster performance than the M1 at the same power level, and then up to 35% at a higher power level. So Apple was showing this graph with 
uh, a 16 watt power consumption compared to the 12 watt that uh, the M1 could do. Now, I do have a theory, and I do think that this is only for the M2 MacBook Pro model and not the MacBook Air, and that is because the MacBook Pro has a fan, so I'm assuming that it will be able to uh, boost its clocks higher and therefore consume more power and therefore achieve better performance on the GPU side. Now, on the video editing side, Apple claims that the M2 is 1.4 times faster than the M1 model. Uh, this is specifically for the MacBook Air. And then in scene edit detection, it is 1.6 times faster than the M1. So it is definitely faster. Just don't imagine some crazy, insanely fast speeds on the new model. They also compare it against the i7-1255U, which is a 12th gen low power chip, uh, which has a, a base power consumption of 15 watts and it can go up to 55. And as expected, uh, the M2 had a higher performance than the Intel chip at just 12.5 watts compared to 28 watts. In this really thin and fanless form factor, the MacBook Air is literally the best option there is. Nothing comes even close in terms of performance. We also have some updated media engines, which are quite interesting. So we have new media engines for 8K, H.264, and also H.265 uh, support. And then also new media engines for ProRes Encode and Decode. And Apple was showing us some graphs. And here we can see that uh, we get a three times video transcode improvement for ProRes RAW over the M1, which is massive. So uh, if you do a lot of ProRes video editing, base editing, then uh, this would be a good improvement. But the thing is, if you have a lot of effects in your timeline, then your overall GPU performance will be impacting that. So in that case, the improvement would be much smaller, only about 1.2 times here. And my last point is regarding AAA games. So Apple showed us Metal FX upscaling, which is essentially the equivalent of DLSS for Apple Silicon only. And they showed two upcoming games that you probably all heard about. No Man's Sky is coming to the Mac and Resident Evil Village is also coming to the Mac. And on the MacBook Air specifically, um, they said that they can drive the game Resident Evil Village in up to 1080p, which is super impressive for a fanless design. Uh, and then the Mac Studio can uh, run it in up to 4K. But yeah, we'll definitely have a video on the M2 MacBook Air versus the M2 Pro and the M1 Air, which ones you get. So definitely subscribe for that. And there is also an iOS 16 things you don't know video coming tomorrow. So yeah, I'm Daniel, this is Enough Tech, and I'll see you guys in the next one. It's Enough Tech, signing out. Cheers.